and welcome to So What You're Saying Is. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, here we are in about week five of this lockdown, and obviously people have had a lot of time for reflection. There's been quite a bit of activity online when it comes to keeping physically fit, PE classes, Pilates, and the rest of it. But what about our emotional and creative and intellectual lives? I mean, this is possibly a very, very good time to draw strength from our own culture, and particularly from the great achievements of our culture, at a time when we have the very time and the hours in which to look at these things anew and maybe become practically involved in them. Now, to discuss these things, I have with me today, I'm very pleased to say, the artist John Long, who is also founder of the Renaissance Workshop. Um, thanks for joining us, John. And um, uh, Tell me, um, first of all, you founded something called the Renaissance Workshop. Before we actually talk about what it wants to do, what actually is it? The Renaissance Workshop is it's an arts and humanities initiative. And it teaches life drawing every week. It, we do creative and interactive art history workshops where people get to interact creatively with the history and legacy of Western art. Um, and these, can, these uh, take place in the galleries and museums, now obviously online. Um, but um, we're providing a lot of, well, I'm providing a lot of uh, sustenance to my community at the moment, um, channeling the traditional arts and heritage into their practice, into their daily life um, through these digital means. Um, but usually that would be in person. Why did you particularly start it up, the Renaissance Workshop? Why did you, you know, what, what, what was behind it? Well, I've just always had a really passionate need to connect to history um, because I was always uh, beleaguered by a sense of meaningless in the modern world, actually. I needed a way to connect to the legacy of the great artists of the past. And that has given my life an incredible sort of um, a, a feeling of... of, 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 of a path of inquiry more than anything, a path to meaning more than anything. Um, when I started going to the National Gallery when I was in my you know, teens, um, I just became completely obsessed with the history of art and um, would always draw in the National Gallery and want to really, really have a, a living connection to the past. Um, because I just felt that for some mysterious reason, connecting to the roots of this tradition, the, you know, the arts and actually gave you, a, a, actually enabled you to cultivate your own creativity in a meaningful way. Um, as though it didn't actually just come from nowhere. I've never really believed in this sort of innate capacity of self-expression from nowhere. I think that all of the great achievements of uh, art come through a legacy. They channel a legacy and they do something original for it. Now, one a, a, a astonishing example would be Velasquez. You know, with that wonderful Rokeby Venus, that one of the greatest treasures in the National Gallery, one of the most, one of the most significant cultural artefacts of all time, um, that seems original. But in fact, um, he was very, very, very well aware of Titian's advancements, using the, the Cupid holding the mirror, for example. And also, we know that Jan van Eyck's Arnulfi de Wedding was in the Spanish Royal Collection at the time that Velázquez was working at the Alcázar in Madrid. Um, and so the mirror, you know, and um, that the, the use of the mirror and the use of the Cupid and Venus, um, these aren't entirely original, but Velázquez used and drew from that legacy to do something completely new. So I think originality and advancements in the arts come through having a creative interaction with the legacy that you belong to. But, you know, when it comes to the Renaissance workshop, how does it how do you practically uh, apply this i mean so you teach people who want to draw in the what you what most people would call the traditional way don't you is is that right to say yeah so basically in my life drawing classes which is where this whole project began um i 
I apply my sort of a background in history and philosophy to really go behind the scenes into the working process of the old masters. Now, in terms of draftsmanship, draftsmanship is a kind of technical process. It's very much a, a creative process, which, is, which has got its own very important principles, principles of drawing. And I look to people like Michelangelo, Pontormo, um, Andrea del Sarto, Luca Signorelli, Andrea del Verrocchio, many, many others, um, Ghirlandaio, Perugino, Raphael. Um, and I look at, their, I devour their drawings. And I basically try to unpick as, to a most in the most authentic manner I possibly can, the actual working process. And I really believe that that working process, the principles of drawing that they utilised, actually cultivate creative spontaneity and freedom. And this isn't the academic yeah. atelier approach that we often see in the sort of, in the, in, you know, I won't name any places, but um, um, in a number of popular institutions, this isn't that sort of measurement where it's all measured and that sort of thing, where you get the same results every time. It's not a system. These are principles of design that actually unlock your potential. And that's why the old masters all look unique. When you look at Michelangelo's drawings or you look at Raphael's drawings, you can see that there's a shared lineage. They're part of the same visual culture. There's a real consistency with them, but there, there is an enormous diversity. You know, they each, if you look at Pontormo's drawings or Rosso Fiorentino's drawings, there's a real sort of dramatic eccentricity to them. And that's unlocked by this process that they had in Florence in the 15th and 16th centuries. And that's what I try and give my people, because I want them to, I want them to use these principles to unlock their potential. Well, I mean, that's an incredibly worthwhile thing to do but I, I wonder before we talk more about the what you actually can get from our particular culture and the achievements of it um, can you just sort of talk about how people can technically link up with you I know that you know you've got you you do lectures for example don't you or you or put, should we say you talk about art and everything if, if people you know want to kind of get involved and they want to learn more what should they do uh, John, where should they go, you know, and what are you offering at the moment? Well, since the beginning of this, um, uh, you know, uh, extraordinary situation, these extraordinary circumstances, this was all happening in person. Workshops in galleries and museums and very intimate community life drawing classes where we go back in time to the early modern, <laughs> to the early modern uh, culture of Europe. Um, but now it's all online and people can go to my website um, they can uh, see my online courses. I've got an online course starting tomorrow, actually. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's called Creative Autonomy, The Principles and Process of Drawing. And I also have another course, which is starting in a few weeks, called uh, <clears throat> Inspiration and Meaning. And that's all about the history and development of Western art and culture. And that's going to be an online course delivered live. And I also have, um, I also post on all the social media networks and that sort of thing. Not very, I'm not very, uh, uh, well, I mean, uh, I like using social media to a certain extent, but it's not really my chosen medium because I love to teach in person. I see. So, I mean, but basically, uh, what you're, from your point of view, uh, how did you get involved in art? I mean, you, you did allude to it there a bit, you, you know, when you, in your teenage years. What, I mean, are you from a kind of artistic background or, or not, you know, socially? Well, I'm from a, a very kind of, I'm from a, uh, a, 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 my background's quite complicated, really. I think my personal reasons for getting so into this was because of my background. You know, I had a, a few difficulties growing up um, that have had a profound uh, impact on my emotional and self creative development and it was a, there was a lot missing in my childhood there was a quite it was a quite a, i had there was a number of destructive things happened and that gave me a real yearning for worth and meaning and direction and i found that in art and in history and when i was at sixth form i had these remarkable teachers henry ward um, who's an amazing contemporary painter and um, Andrew, Andy Collard, who's another contemporary painter, Darren O'Connor. So these amazing teachers who really did encourage me to interact with the history of art. They could see that I had this, they, had, they could see that I had an obsession of drawing skulls and they encouraged me to broaden my horizon and um, my horizons. And uh, I was sent to the National Gallery to look at um, some paintings and it just became a, 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 something I had to do every week, twice a week, go there and draw. And um, so that very deeply personal reasons that really um, 
made me, you know, become quite uh, attached to the history of art. And uh, uh, yeah, so uh, lots of personal things put me, got me here. Yeah. yeah. But it was sort of so basically it was something you found yourself really then. Well, it didn't. It, I wasn't. No, the, the, it, well, I remember when I was young, um, my mum used to take me to National Trust houses. And um, that was incredibly, uh, I mean, the Middle Ages, the English Middle Ages, distinctly the, the, the distinct landscape of, of England and the wonderful cathedrals and houses and castles. I just became totally besotted with um, the Middle Ages. Yeah, so and, nice. uh, and, and I remember seeing uh, a longbow, uh, a wonderful English medieval longbow. And uh, I remember just asking the gentleman, a wonderful gentleman who was working there, um, what's that made, what's that made of? Was that made of? And uh, what wood is it? And uh, I remember him, he thought it was oak, but it, I late subsequently discovered that it's actually you. Um, but that was just that kind of encouragement from my mum, really, um, to, you know, because she knew that, that I needed some, some kind of direction in my life. And um, that she really nurtured that, actually. And I think, yeah, no, I think, I think that it really does actually come from maybe there and also my teachers and also just my own fanatical love for old things for old books and the belief the heartfelt passionate belief that through interacting with history we can cultivate our own creative selves and it can be incredibly nurturing and empowering do you think actually that that's something we've kind of lost you know you say that by interacting with history and I suppose by that as well, specifically with art, it's about the traditions of our art, it's the, you know, the, the, the various story of our, our art, if you like. Um, History you and development become, of Western art and culture. Have we become kind of disconnected from that in a way, do you think? I think one of, or if not the, greatest tragedy or the greatest problem we currently face in the modern world is this remarkable sense that Western culture, as it is, is a historical phenomenon. That we, that Western heritage and Western culture coming from its Hellenic roots and then its perturbations of Hellenism through the Middle, through the through late antiquity and the Middle Ages and so on, that that has that had a finishing point, and now in this current age, we don't have a, a means to affirm of that legacy. We don't have a, a means to actually have a, a living bond with our cultural DNA, and I think that the the, the the vital problem with that, the really heartbreaking problem with that, is that that's who we are. Your, your vision of life, my vision of life, my moral, vision, my moral sense, my sense of meaning is actually derived from, from history, actually. I don't think there is a meaningful difference at all between history and culture. I think hi culture basically is determined by history. And I think that culture determines the way you see the world and you understand the world. And the fact that our cultural DNA is so remote, it's historicised. It's some form of irony, it's, and it's always under attack. It's always denigrated. It's, we, all, we want to distance ourselves from it. I think that has just incubated and cultivated a collective bereavement, a subconscious collective bereavement of the Western mind. And I want to challenge that. I want, I want to, I want to, I want to flood the modern world with Western art and heritage because I think we need to have a living, ongoing connection with this remarkable and unique legacy. It should be open to everyone. You're exactly, but you're saying so when you say it's been historic, historic, historical, as it were, you're saying that it's something that is in the past that's no longer going on. That for most people they just see it as something that's there. That what is our culture now? You know, it's not that. But of course, what you're saying, presumably, is actually no, it's all around us all the time. It is what we are. It's what we are. It's, 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 it, it courses through our veins. You know, Velasquez, Rembrandt, Plato, Aristotle, Xenophon. 
you know, David Hume, Kant, Spinoza. These are these are our these are the these are the architects of who we are, you know. And I think that culture um, is so vital for any form of self affirmation. And if your culture is somehow remote from the present world, you know, we have these we have the we have the sort of the the, the remains. We have the artifacts. But where's the living bond? You know, that's the that that's that, you know, I, the, my project is really and my my personal mission, not just, you know, forget the Renaissance workshop. For me, it's all about having a robust and passionate affirmation of Western art and culture and its creative, intellectual and moral legacy. I want to connect to it. I find it empowering and I want to share that with everyone. I want to share that. I've had the amazing opportunity um, just this week to share it with people who are destitute in this country and um, through a charity that contacted me. And these are people from all over the world. These are people who have entered the country from elsewhere. And in this current situation, the opportunity to actually share the, the, the wonder and mystery of art and culture and to enable them to enter into it, to envelop them within it. Is, it was the greatest privilege of my life, actually. And um, that they've now become members. You know, the door's open. My door is open to anyone anywhere in the world. And I just really wish to just uh, promote the, the, the interaction and participation in Western art and culture and heritage. Do you, what do you think, particularly at the moment, given what we're going through at the moment, what, what, what strengths will people derive from it? I think you've... You've touched on that already a bit, but you know, obviously, you teach people. You teach people traditional drawing. You're now doing these things online. What, what actually will people get from it? I mean, what strengths will they get from it? Do you think they won't be alone? They won't be alone. They will have the. They will have a connection to their extended family and that they are the, the 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 people who have shaped our culture okay so that's one fundamental one kind of semi religious almost uh, perhaps um it's a it's a spiritual feeling it's a spiritual connection they will they will gain um a sense of being and meaning and place instead of this uh Instead of instead of the sense, what they will get is an actual distinctive sense of who they are, a connection to their heritage, their culture. So a, a sense of self affirmation, a sense of cultural affirmation, and they will have achieved something which the modern world, to me, seems to be pathologically against, which is um, a sense of there being something something distinctive and meaningfully distinct about um, cultures and a standard of judgment as well, um, rather than this uh, predominant idea that they're all interchangeable. This sense that things are not actually trivial. There is this remarkable sense, um, there's this remarkable sense in, um, which is um, almost ir irrefutable, um, that cultures and civilizations are all interchangeable, and that um, all ideas ha are, are, are all ideas and um, all um, all philosophies and all ethical systems are equally valid. Um, whereas I really feel that that's just nauseating and appalling because it trivialises everything. If you if you if everything's interchangeable, everything's ultimately meaningless. And that's just really that to me that really gets my back up because I need some form of affirmation. And um, that's what I really hope people will get beyond the technique, beyond the um, beyond just having these technical skills, something that to actually situate them in a, in a and to give them some meaningful status. Yeah. And to show how they can actually relate, um, how, they, how, how one person can can have a personal relationship with their own history and culture. Have you seen any kind of, you know, you mentioned your experiences this week with with people who are destitute. What about in the people that you you teach and in the classes, or whether they are in you know in real life as it were or online? Um, what kind of things have you seen? What have the effects been on people? You know, have you sort of seen people become feeling to use that modern for empowered by it? I mean, or you know, or what? What? Um, I have built some overwhelmingly. 
wonderful connections with people. Um, the, since starting this project just three years ago, I've made connections with people that have just become, it's, I've, I've created a community. I've created a community, lots of different people, and some of the people that have interacted with the Renaissance Workshop, I mean, on the website, there's a testimonial from somebody very, very important to the Renaissance Workshop, um, which speaks about the personal effects that she's had. And, but I've just, I, I, I don't want to kind of uh, be over self-congratulatory, but I think I've created a path for people um, which allows them to be creative in a way which isn't self-critical. I think I've allowed people to be, to use a creative process which is liberating and positive and generates positive emotion. Um, and I think what I'm, what I'm told is that my enthusiasm is, is, is a very positive thing and that people get, people can really see that I love art and that uh, I love sharing it and that, um, and, and, and also the technical stuff as well. I mean, like, uh, people have always thanked me for the lessons and in technical and theoretical insights about the creative process that have, you know, in, enabled them to reach some of their artistic goals or work, work, uh, work effectively towards them. Um, it's obviously something I've been doing for, you know, for my whole, my whole life and um, something I, you know, the opportunity to share it is just, uh, is just a remarkable privilege and um, I aim to do it for the rest of my life. Do you think, I mean, again, this is maybe a bit of a cliche question, but um, how do you, what would you say to people who've got a kind of interest, they've got a vague interest, as you mentioned, they're going around national trust houses and things. I mean, honestly, that's the way it starts for many people. Uh, they've got a vague interest, but they, but they do feel sort of maybe, no, this isn't for me, or they feel slightly intimidated by it, they want to learn more. What would you say to them? I mean... You know that they. Sh how would you, how would you convince them that they've got something? You know that really they have got that they can give. Well, I'm from a. I'm from. A, I'm, well, I'm. I'm from a very working class background, and you know the, the the class that you know the fact that I'm I'm spouting high culture. I'm spouting traditionalism. I'm spouting. Um, you know, I'm really promoting. And a, a, an elitist vision, actually. Um, but I come. The irony is that I'm from a, 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 a working class background. Now, the thing is, is that I think that high art and high culture is for everyone. And a lot of the greatest ever were from the lower classes. Okay, um, Aristotle and Plato may have been aristocrats, but Velasquez wasn't. He became one through the arts. Um, same with Anthony Van Dyke. When Anthony Van Dyke, um, he was a, a journeyman working with Sir Peter Paul Rubens, and in the sixteen late sixteen thirties or very early sixteen no, it would have been the sixteen thirties. Um, he was uh, actually given a house on Fleet Street and a very generous stipend by Charles I, and uh, and was knighted. Um, so, like uh, the the arts and culture is um, a, a, a tremendous sort of. Um, but I, I think the irony is really that the art, the high art and high culture is actually the most inclusive thing ever. Um, and that it, 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 is, it, is, it is so accessible. It's, the irony is that it appears to be elitist. It appears to be for the, for, the, for the elites. And that's something to do, you know, it's the fact that intellectual culture, and, and, and especially in this country, has largely been privatised. We don't teach philosophy like they do in France, and that's a big issue. Um, yeah. Uh, and but but I, I have you know although I'm spouting a, a view of high culture which, which, which is which, which which strives for excellence and does actually to a degree affirm of excellence which we, you can't have without a form of inequality so there is an elitism a creative sort of elitism or an aristocratic ideal to put it in Nietzschean terms um, the irony is is that that's a, a, a perception but the, the the arts are for everyone and that's the that's the thing that it can appear to be um for elites it's like i'm using two different ways of, of using that word that you know the word elite um but the elites are generally tasteless you know i mean and the wealthiest and and the the real elites are generally don't actually have a connection um it's it, it you know there's a lot of the best stuff comes from the most un, un, un uh, surprising places and um 
I would say that if they're put off because they think that high culture and, you know, Bach or Handel or Velasquez um, or Michelangelo is, is for, I don't know, educated people, that's completely nonsense. Just look at it. It's for everyone. These are figurative artworks, naturalistic artworks, poetic artworks um, that anyone can be inspired by. I think actually, I would, I would agree. I mean, to, to maybe a prosaic point, but it's interesting that Whereas a lot of people wouldn't bother to maybe go into a modern art gallery, for example, um, uh, you know, the, the importance of the great works of the art of the past in the Western canon, the importance of them is shown in by the fact that people travel miles still, tourists, to see the Sistine Chapel, to see this, to see that, you know, to, to, to see the Vatican. All of these, they know instinctively almost that these are great things. And, you know, it's wonderful to see people's reactions. You know, it, but they wouldn't necessarily go and see, I don't know, the White Cube Gallery or whatever in, in Whitechapel or wherever it is. Oh, well, I would. When they've got Anselm Kiefer exhibitions at the White Cube, I certainly go. Um, but now, I mean, there's a lot of brilliant contemporary art. There's lots of wonderful contemporary painting. I mean, just look at Michael Borromans or look at Andy Collard. I mean, there's a wonderful and, you know, Dirk Scriber or Sasnell. There are wonderful contemporary arts. Uh, artists, but they all, they're only great because they actually draw from the past. They're not afraid of the past. And uh, especially Michael Borromans, um, he's brilliant. I mean, he, uh, he said that to actually fully understand something and to, to be able to respond to it, you have to actually interact with its history. Um, and that's coming from a contemporary artist. So there's hope. You know, there is, there really is, there is a, there is energy. There is a good energy there. I'm not alone. Well, I'm glad, I'm, I'm very, I'm very hit, pleased to hear that and very optimistic and I'm very heartened by it. Um, John, we're going to sign off now, but I just want to make sure again that if people want to find out what you're doing and where they can maybe watch or get involved, they should best go to, what, your website? The RenaissanceWorkshop.com um, or the Instagram for the Renaissance Workshop. <clears throat> um, yeah, that sort of stuff, really. Okay. Well, look, Thank you very, very much for joining us. And uh, I think it's a great thing you're doing. And I think particularly, as you've made the case, this is a very, very good time, an important time to actually look at our own cultural heritage and, and do something with it. Um, thanks very much indeed, John. Uh, that's it for this week on So What You're Saying Is. And I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. And um, please do subscribe, won't you? And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.